All right, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Carolyn Supple. Carolyn is the founding chair and executive director of the Press Forward. Carolyn, thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having us, Chase. Of course. And can you start by talking a little bit about the work you do at the Press Forward, um, what the mission of the organization is, and, and basically why you're so passionate about this cause? Absolutely. The Press Forward is a nonprofit and nonpartisan initiative that's dedicated to advancing newsroom culture and elevating women in the workplace. We focus on training, research, and education. And our story is that we arose during the passion of the Me Too movement by some of the women who had the courage to tell their stories about their um, experiences in the newsroom by some of the most powerful men in news. But we knew that we had to pivot beyond the men in order to look at why all of this happened across the industry and what were some of the solutions that could help transform um, the newsroom culture. Uh, we know that, for example, harassment occurs in environments with there's incivility, disrespect, and inequality. And we saw some of the larger problems that faced the industry tied back to culture from the inability to adapt to change um, during digital disruption to the fact that women were rising into leadership. And we wanted to provide some professional solutions to this big picture problem, um, beginning with our own personal stories. Okay. And we originally had talked about having this podcast or this discussion on October 17th which you actually had to remind me was the one year anniversary of the Me Too movement. And I think that um, that's where we should start the conversation is more generally around what the Me Too movement is and kind of where it is today. So can you start by reminding listeners what it was that sparked the Me Too movement in the first place and kind of how it started coming together on social media? Absolutely. So it was actually three years ago. I can't believe three years have flown by, oh, wow. um, but it began on October 17th when um, the New York Times and the New Yorker began to uh, publish a series of articles about workplace abuse by um, Harvey Weinstein, the, the famous new, um, movie producer. And there had been decades of just normalized sexual harassment um, by famous actresses who were engaged in quid pro quo, which means like you have to, you know, sleep with somebody in order to get a job or they faced harassment while they were on the job. And some of these abuses were just, were literally criminal. And um, many women have experienced some form of harassment during their careers, but we thought that it was just part of the professional workplace. And so the, lift, the, the Me Too movement and the reporting that started lifted the veil on things that had become normalized that never should have been. Um, the, there's a series of, of important rulings that were passed in the 1960s and 70s that found um, if you uh, make a, a pass at somebody in the workplace or discriminate against them because of their gender, that's illegal. But the problem is that it hasn't been enforced. And there were a secret set of rules um, that had just been put into place across industries, anywhere that there's power um, that women had been facing for a very long time. So it, it kind of tipped off this movement um, but it really was, it was more than just a moment, like this had been years in the making. Um, and the, the, the term Me Too came from Trana Burke, who's an activist in New York, who'd focused on domestic violence. And um, you know, she, she started doing work decades ago and she realized just how normal that was. And then the Me Too movement that was profiled from Harvey Weinstein um, was a little bit different because it focused on the workplace. So, when you think about Me Too, there's two pieces to it. There's the domestic violence piece, and then there's also workplace abuse. Um, but again, we were interested in kind of looking at the bigger picture. For, for us, this wasn't about gender. Yes, women are more likely to be discriminated against, but it's because it's a power issue, and women haven't traditionally been in positions of power. And so in order to crack this, we wanted to look specifically at the news industry, because the news industry is what lifted the veil, as I had said. And it came to pass that there were also the most powerful men in the news industry were also abusers. And so how could we trust the press when their most you know, powerful voices were also abusing their power behind the scene? They, they couldn't live up to their mission or have integrity. Um, so we wanted to understand professional reasons why it occurred and some professional solutions. 
Um, so I hope that I hope that helps kind of explain where the origins are. But it was an explosion after the first story happened with um, Jody Cantor and Ronan Farrow from the New Yorker and the New York Times. Like they, once just one industry after the other, there there were just you know major major abuses of power for decades. And these are people's lives and careers that were altered um, because they felt that they had to choose between their dignity and their career. And no one should ever have to make that choice. But again, it's, it's linked to broader workplace cultural challenges and it's about power. And the workplace is the most important place in our lives right now. And so if it's not a place where you can do your best work, where you know your rights, where there's clear pathways to the top, um, where people who are leading and managing are doing so ethically and effectively, uh, we all lose. Yeah, absolutely. We spend what, like a third of our lives in our workplace. So if, if that workplace environment is unhealthy, then your life is going to be unhealthy. Um, this movement so far has helped us catch some outright monsters. You mentioned movie producer Harvey Weinstein, um, some other notable um, people who have been, I guess you could say, outed for their abuses are comedian Bill Cosby, as well as the CEO of Fox News, Roger Ailes. Um, I'm curious what you would say is the greatest victory or, or kind of set of victories of the Me Too movement so far. And I ask that because bringing down these men is important, but ultimately these are just kind of three individual men. The problem is much more systemic. We're going to get into that and the work you're doing at the Press Forward. But is it bringing down these men? Is it creating a safer space for women to come forward? Is it just generally more awareness from both sexes that these abuses are taking place? What do you, what do you think is the greatest benefit that's come from the movement so far? Um, I, I mean, I think the greatest benefit so far has been raising awareness around the behavior um, of, of sexual harassment in particular. And um, before, all these articles came out and before the movement started, no one could put a name to the behavior. So, um, you know, we knew that harassment was occurring. The data had been out there for a very long time in the workplace, but we didn't put stories behind them. And so to see some of our most, you know, glorified and um, important public personas all of a sudden be abusers made people realize, oh, wow, this is systemic. This says something about the way that women are valued in the workplace. It says something, the way that power changes us when we get it. It means that, um, you know, laws that have been in place for decades aren't actually being enacted. And um, I think that the, the bad actors that made the headlines were really just um, a bellwether for, for bigger problems in the workplace. Um, so I'd say that while it's important that, of course, people who have been harassing their colleagues for a very long time are held accountable it would be a mistake just to focus on the bad men and the bad actors um, because our research and work has found um, that what enabled them to harm others for so long were networks of complicity. There were people who surrounded them who were aware of their behavior, who, who didn't report it or who ignored it or who didn't stand up for those who are the most vulnerable in the workplace. And we have to unpack that and that's going to be painful and it's going to take time. And, um, the change that's required, um, according to our work, is that we need more women in leadership right now, especially in newsrooms. We were able to quantify for the first time that only 28% of newsroom leaders are women, um, even though they comprise the majority of journalism students across the country. So we need to figure out why they're dropping off and fix that. Because in environments in which women lead, um, this is what according to the sociology and the research shows, harassment's less likely to be experienced. However, if we believe women are equal, they can be equally bad because this is about power. Right. And so we have to talk about what it means to be an ethical and effective leader. Because I'm sure you've read some of the stories this year too about abusive female bosses. And um, these are all tied to the bigger issue of what happens to us when we gain power in positions of leadership. Um, so the newsroom is a really unique culture because they, they never really teach leadership and management. It's all about the content. It's all about the story. And so they, they sometimes don't embrace the fact that it's also a workplace. And when you rise up the ranks, you need to train your leaders and managers. Some of the most celebrated leaders in our newsrooms have never received a leadership training. Um, and so if people don't feel comfortable coming forward to talk about the challenges that they face in the workplace, which is a, a job of a leader is to create safety and to get rid of toxic people. Um, if they don't address that, then 
Um, you know, you're not going to get the best news product. You're, you're not going to pivot and be able to survive for the future. And people will be more focused on surviving the workplace politics and um, a toxic work environment than they will be on figuring out how to inform the public during a really critical moment for the press. So it's nuanced and it's complicated because on the one hand, it's easy just to fire the bad actors. But on the other hand, it says something about who we are and our workplace when that type of stuff happens. And that requires more examination, requires holding more people accountable, and it requires doing the work. Um, I don't think it's rocket science. Men and women should be able to work together. And again, these issues aren't necessarily about gender, they're about power and we have a love for guys. Um, but at the same time, women aren't advancing and we have to talk about that. Um, they're not advancing into leadership across corporate America. So why is that? And what can we do to make sure that men and women can work together better? Yeah. I want to get into a little bit of that nuance that you mentioned. So I think most men and women agree that the Me Too movement has been beneficial, that it's net benefit, it's good to society. Um, I think there is really one major concern that some men have, which is just the idea of due process, that if they are alleged to have done something, um, the allegation travels far and wide over social media, and sometimes they lose their job before there's even um, any kind of actual legal recourse or benefit of the doubt. So I guess uh, the, part of this has to do with the phrase that's also become popular, which is believe all women. So can you kind of speak to me about the nuances of due process in these situations and the idea of believing all women? Yeah, well, thank you so much for that question um, and for sharing what guys are thinking right now. Um, I mean, just to put that just to put that into context. So the vast majority of men are good. So let's just start there. Right. And what we read about in the headlines um, were some people who were very bad and it took the work, hard work of journalists to make sure that they weren't reporting false um, accusations, right? So the same newspaper that reported on Watergate that broke, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning stories also did the investigative work around Charlie Rose. So it, he went through the same process. So it's not like someone can just call up the Washington Post and say, so-and-so harassed me and they'll publish it. Um, in fact, there are plenty of stories that never made it to the press because their harassers weren't famous. Um, so let's just start there. Like the, the vast majority of men are good. It takes a lot of work um, to make it into the press and journalists have actually a pretty important vetting process. Um, and then let's also take into account that there's a, a significant percentage of people who will face harassment at work and a, a very, very slim number of cases um, of people who actually do experience mistreatment, who do it the right way, who go to HR and report it, um, they don't get justice. So the system's broken too. So they go to the press because it's the last resort. Um, and I also think that to uh, get a gender discrimination case, um, if you decide to go the legal option, the bar is pretty high to, to actually show discrimination because companies are protecting themselves and you have to have years and years of documentation. And the way that harassment usually um, transpires is behind closed doors. Um, it's not... It's, it's not over, over email or videotaped or anything. Um, it can be years of, of abuse and it takes a lot of courage for people to come forward with their stories. Yeah. Um, so, so know that when you read about it, it's, and it makes the press, there was a huge bar to be left over in order to hear those stories. And um, telling your story is just 10% of the battle. What comes after that is really hard. Women who speak up about gender discrimination or harassment are um, most likely going to be face retaliation. There's a study that just came out from the National Women's Law Center um, that found that nearly three quarters of women who reported it and went through the right channels at work and weren't just reputationally harming someone um, did face discrimination and retaliation after they had raised some of these issues. 
So there's no benefit to speaking up. It takes a tremendous amount of courage. And if you're a normal person, you should be fine. <laughs> so the idea that there's, um, that men are worried about due diligence, I mean, you have to understand that the, the floodgates that opened during Me Too is because there's been decades and decades of women who have been harmed and the system failed them and the press was the last resort. Right. So, um, at the same time, though, I think it's really important that we all have these conversations about what is the law, what does behavior look like, making sure training is effective, because there's a difference between somebody who makes just an off-color joke and maybe gets in a little bit of trouble versus somebody who um, harms their colleague by saying, in order to be successful at this company, you have to sleep with me or, or you'll lose your job. And that's why that's criminal, right? So I think the vast majority of men should um, feel safe uh, and should support the women who have spoken up um, because again, there's no benefit to going through this. It's, it's tremendously um, harmful for women's careers to speak about gender discrimination, to, to look at the inequities and um, the concept that there's no due diligence for men um, isn't right. It just, there is due diligence for men. They've been protected for a very long time through um, HR systems and the laws that haven't been enforced. And I think we need to put a little bit of focus on uh, those who, who are actually facing discrimination at work and, and thinking about that first. Not to say that, um, you know, the idea that you can have build this amazing career and all of a sudden it be ended overnight because of a sensational story, um, that's terrifying. But again, the people who, who we read about in the press were abusers for years. And it took the hard work of reporters to actually show that they had been um, doing what, what they reported about. So if you're like, again, you're a normal person, you should be fine. Okay, good. Well, I think men feel reassured. Um, I know you mentioned it at the top of the podcast, um, and it's also listed on the Press Forward's website as one of your values is this idea of love for guys. Um, obviously, as a man, I appreciate that your work and the work you're doing is, is focused on the issues surrounding harassment and not necessarily uh, labeling all men as the problem. Um, how can men be part of the solution? You know, we have some really amazing male allies on our advisory board and we've had some, a lot of discussions about that, but the research shows if you wanna look at harassment specifically, um, you, if you see somebody you know, be able to recognize the behavior and if you see it, it's actually better for the reporting to come from an ally than it is from the person experiencing the harassment. So stand up for the person in the room. It could be a man or a woman who's experiencing mistreatment. Um, and the way that you'll see it, it, it may not be so black and white, right? Someone will come into your office feeling uneasy or upset, or they'll, they'll talk about an interaction and they'll say like, oh, this happened, but oh, please don't say anything. But you have to. Um, I mean, the, the, the reporting requirements are also tightening across states after the Me Too uh, moment happened because um, there's, a, there's a bigger emphasis on leaders and managers to make sure that employees know their right and they, protect it and they protect them. So that's the first step. It's just knowing when to report on harassment specifically. But the broader issue of how can men and women work better together and be allies I mean, you look at the data, you see women only get 2.8% of venture capital dollars. You see that they're not rising into leadership. Um, it, it just, it's not rocket science. Bring them into the room, <laughs> you know? Um, we also know that women are evaluated based on their, their um, women are evaluated based on their personality um, more so than they are on their impact to the business. So strengthen, if you're a leader manager of a startup or a company, like look at your performance management processes and make sure that they're equally in and check your own kind of behavior and biases. If, if you see a woman who's not acting like your expectation of what a woman should act like, she's direct, she's, um, you know, gets to, she gets down to the details quickly and she's maybe a little intimidating, don't exclude her just or say that she's not liked because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Instead, pivot and be like, oh, she's really good at business. <laughs> um, I bet she'd be really good for this particular assignment instead of like, wow, like, well, she's kind of direct. I don't know if I want someone with that communication style in my office. Like, you know, the, that's what the research shows holds women back. Um, and so really think about what does it take for my company or to my workplace to be successful? What are the skills we need um, versus who are the people who I like around me? That's when women tend to get left behind and not just women, minorities. Um, and women, you know, can do it too. It's, it's, it's not just 
make this about a certain demographic. Like everybody wants to sometimes result back to their own tribes <laughs> around people who make them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to focus more on the skills mm -hmm. of what it takes to build a business. Um, and it's come from, a, come from a place of assuming good intent. Okay. Um, so the other piece, again, we talked to our male allies a lot about this. We talked to sociologists and researchers. Um, and men, I've, my male allies and friends have told me that like men have some work to do too. Like they have to come together and talk about why the current state is what it is. And that's not work that I can do for them. Um, they have to come together and think about how they can be better allies. And, and women have to invite them into the room, into this work. And so I really appreciate you inviting me into this conversation so that we can talk about it um, in an honest and helpful way. Yeah. Um, because if it's just women talking to other women, like we'll never get anywhere. And, and men and women have to work together. It also means that sometimes men are gonna hear stuff that they don't like, and we're gonna hear stuff that we don't like, but we have to work through it respectfully. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what is the scale of this problem? How, how big is it? Is it quantifiable? Um, you mentioned a few offhand numbers there. Can you maybe give us some more offhand statistics that help represent just the, the scale of this problem of sexual harassment in the workplace? And well, we're focused on newsrooms specifically. So our numbers show, according to the International Women's Media Foundation, um, that nearly two thirds of women will face harassment sometimes during their career, most likely at work, and it won't be reported. Um, so think about that. The fact that nearly two thirds of journalism students are women um, and the number of them who will be affected by harassment, it's life altering, it's horrible. It makes you feel like you have to choose between your dignity and career and most everyone's gonna face it either in the newsroom or by a source. <laughs> so there has to be better training, but that's the size of the problem. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a, something bigger about the culture in which this is so prevalent and it tends to happen in environments where women don't rise into leadership and we know we, we did the hard work of recruiting news organizations into McKinsey's and LeanIn.org's Women in the Workplace study. And then they did a special cut of the data to show what's happening in media and news. And they found that women comprise, they reach kind of parity as they enter the industry with men. But as they climb the ladder, they drop out at every level. And by the time they get to the top, it's only 28% of women in leadership and it's even worse for people of color. Um, so it says something about pattern recognition, the informality of the workplace and how the, pro the promotion process happens, um, the tightness of networks and who gets to rise and who doesn't, um, and the uh, lack of transparency about what makes a leader and how someone can attain those skills. Um, and, and that's kind of the bigger problem that faces the industry. And then the, the overlay that with the need for better leadership and management cultures because the newsroom has historically focused on the content and not on the workplace. And so they don't know how to communicate effectively to and delegate um, and might resort to screaming and bullying and incivility um, at the same time that they're supposed to be, you know, courageous at uh, challenging authority. Journalists can also walk into a newsroom that's very hierarchical and not want to challenge their editor. Um, so it's a, it's a unique culture that requires uh, change from the classroom and into the newsroom and all the way to the boardroom. Um, but to quantify the problem, um, again, I think that's, that, that's what we're facing. It's most likely going to be women who harass, but it says something bigger about the culture in which who, who rises to leadership. And in order to fix it, we have to gather the data and look and discuss about what would make an ethical and effective leader and then start having that conversation in newsrooms, but also the next generation of journalists so that they can lead and manage ethically. And it's really important that harassment is seen not as a women's issue, but as a leadership issue. Um, because if this is happening on your watch, it means that, that there's something about your workplace where people don't feel safe um, and you're empowering the wrong people to lead. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, sometimes the sexual harassment can come from the source itself. So when a journalist goes out and, and is maybe interviewing someone or trying to uh, gain access to somebody with information that they're sometimes the, the abusers themselves. Can you speak to that? Oh yeah. Well, um, there was a, a Fox News host who, who said that women journalists are likely to sleep with their sources and that couldn't be further from the, the truth. Um, women are actually more likely to be harassed by their sources and it's those negative stereotypes from Hollywood and, and others that make people feel that project a certain stereotype about women reporters that's really damaging. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I experienced it when I was just starting out in my career. Um, you are alone on, uh, you know, like on a story and 
and a person flirts with you or they follow up, but you, you're, you're interested in who they are as a journalist and some people mistake that for interest. And so they'll follow up with you and ask you out for dinner. And, um, you know, that to me was pretty benign and like, Oh, thank you. I'm flattered, but I'm, I'm professional. Like, no, thank you. But some women, um, can be put in dangerous and violent situations. Um, uh, so, you know, we've, we've heard of stories of women who've been murdered on assignment and, um, there are others who have said like, Oh, if you want the story, like you have to sleep with me. And it's really horrible. Um, but the, I, I don't know the number offhand of, of how many women face that by sources, but it can be, it can be particularly, um, serious in male dominated professions like finance. And, um, and I think they're cracking down on it in sports, but it, it had been prevalent for a long time when they're not used to seeing women in the room in a leadership role, they, they sometimes harass them. And, I know you focus on sexual harassment in the newsroom, but um, do you have any idea how it compares to other workplaces? Is, is Are newsrooms even worse as far as sexual harassment environments? Um, well, here's where harassment is likely to occur um, with incredible hierarchies. Um, so big power differentials where there's job insecurity, um, long hours, um, there's, there might be uh, informal cultures where you're kind of there late at night getting a story done or, you know, think about all the, all the informalities that can occur in the workplace across industries um, where people aren't necessarily formalized uh, through HR and training and things like that. And um, where we also see uh, really like male dominated leadership. So that's, that's where it's likely to occur. That is a news industry. Um, and it's also multiple industries. It could be academics. It could be, um, you know, technology. It can be the, the legal industry. Um, and so there has to be some unpacking to be done um, in order to make sure that there's environments in which everyone can, see, can succeed. Um, so our research has found there's a really great study that was just put out by our chair um, that looked at kind of why newsrooms were such a perfect storm. And um, some of their findings took into account the fact that, um, you know, they, the news industry itself is considered to be, um, you know, work, conceiving work solely as creating journalistic content. Um, they, they have this kind of culture in which everybody had to pay their dues. And so therefore, um, there's some toxic rituals and there's rites of passages and norms. And then again, the high power differentials. And then the fact that there's um, kind of informal HR and then the industry is being disrupted. So all of these factors made it very vulnerable to abuses of power. Um, and yes, we're addressing harassment, but again, the big, we're, we're, we need to pivot beyond just where harassment occurs to the workplace culture and why that has to advance so that it's an environment where men and women can work together <laughs> Where, where we have positive workplace cultures um, so that journalists can do their best work. Because I really think that it's, it comes down to, this is a freedom of the press issue um, and our democracy is at stake. If journalists can't focus on doing their work in the newsroom, how the hell can they watch out for you and me? If they're more worried about, um, you know, how are they gonna pay their bills and keep their job and get to the next level, they're not thinking about breaking a story um, and caring about other people if no one's caring about them. Uh, so to me, that's how big the issue is. And, and, and we know that the more connected um, a journalist is to a certain demographic or audience, the deeper the understanding of the challenges that that audience faces. And the fact that our newsrooms don't reflect America could be also why the, America doesn't trust the press right now, because the stories aren't necessarily reflecting the challenges that they face. If all of our major newsrooms are focused on um, New York and Washington and, and parts of California. So what's happening with COVID, what's happening with the Me Too movement, the racial reckonings, I think that type of horrible disruptive change, the calling out of bad actors in the long run will actually lead to more positive outcomes because we're surfacing behavior that we know has been a problem for a very long time. Yeah. So let's say someone is watching this episode and they work in a newsroom and they're experiencing harassment of some kind. Are there steps that they should go through to try to report that harassment, to try to deal with it? Like, for example, step one is try to go to your HR 
to submit a formal complaint. And then if you don't hear back within a week or two, there's a second step. What, what would you say to somebody watching that wants to um, basically come out and report an abuse? Um, well, make sure that you, first of all, get educated about your rights and you're able to qualify the behavior. So I'd encourage you to take a, a look at our website, thepressboard.org, where we talk about how sexual harassment actually manifests in the workplace. You can also go to the EEOC. And then the second step is, and everybody should do that, we should just know what the behavior looks like so we can eradicate it and identify it. Um, <clears throat> the second step is just document everything. Make sure that you save your emails. Once you experience something, write it down right away. Um, tell your friends, tell your colleagues that you experienced this. Um, and then go to somebody who you trust. So <clears throat> a manager or a HR leader and just say you experienced this and you'd like to file a complaint. Um, you know, unfortunately, the research shows and in and, and multiple, you know, people we've worked with that, that sometimes that pathway doesn't work. And so you might also want to talk to an employment lawyer to make sure that you um, uh, are getting the protections that you need um, for your job, because most, most companies take retaliation very seriously. Um, but not every news organization has robust HR mechanisms. And unfortunately, there are a lot of organizations that are more focused on protecting themselves than they are and watching out for an employee who suffered abuse. So, um, you know, again, document, tell people, and then if people witness it, they have a duty to report. So if you see somebody who's actually experienced harassment or if somebody has come to you and told them about your experience, we're now at a place where you have a duty to report it. And that's actually a more effective way for the perpetrator to be held accountable um, while the other person's being protected. And then talk to an employment lawyer. Um, I really hope no one has to face that at, you know, in their careers, but that's what we would recommend. Um, and then take care of yourself. Make sure that you, you know, are uh, fortified by friends and family and you exercise and you focus on well-being um, and, and make sure that you know that your future is bright and you'll be taken care of. So you said that other coworkers now have a duty to report. It, that's a, is that a new um, corporate law or just, an, what is that? Um, well, and uh, there's, there has been some revised state laws around sexual harassment that's found that managers and leaders um, need to, or, or are now held accountable if harassment happens in their workplace. And you do have to report it. That's a lot of company policies that if, if you witness it or somebody comes to you and tells you about it, it's not up to you to be the um, arbiter of justice. Like you, you have to report it if it's about gender or protected class. Um, and again, a protected class is somebody who faces um, discrimination because of their um, family status. You know, maternal bias is a huge thing. Um, or if you experience sexual harassment um, or if you see LGBTQ um, discrimination, or um, even if you're a man and you're experiencing harassment, that's protected. <laughs> you know, you, you shouldn't have to deal with that if you're a man or a woman. Um, so just being aware of, of uh, this idea that if somebody comes to you and says, I'm facing this type of behavior by a manager, it's abusive. Um, you, you actually, most companies now, especially if you're a manager or leader, like you do have a duty to report to HR and to those above you. Okay. And you're doing some pilot programs now. I, I believe you're working with a few um, universities and a couple of newsrooms right now. Um, yeah, so our initiatives are focused on systemic change. The first one is that we knew we had to, to innovate sexual harassment training because it was broken. It needed to be tailored to the industry, it had to be rooted in journalism. And so we partnered with the Pointer Institute and we created this really powerful curriculum um, that focuses more on culture and abuse of power than it does narrowly myopically focus on um, the, you know, click through HR or sexual harassment training. So it's, it can help surface some of the cultural issues that make people feel like they're not safe to raise um, abuse in the workplace so that people feel safe when they go to work. Um, the second thing that we're, and that's been piloted at the Wall Street Journal, Pointers Leadership Academy and the Tampa Bay Times. Um, we did have a huge plan to roll it out at other other newsrooms and then COVID happened and our research has found that in-person training is the most effective. So we're pivoting, um, but we're really proud of what we've built on the training program. And the second thing that we knew we had to do is to quantify the leadership pipeline for women in news. And as I mentioned, we, we released a report um, in collaboration with McKinsey. It was McKinsey who wrote it called Chattering the Glass Screen, 
which looks at the, the specific factors that um, are preventing women from rising into leadership and quantifies that for the first time. And we're gonna be doing that year after year. And we convene news leaders to look at the data and those who participated have been from the New York Times, CNN, the Wall Street Journal, ABC News, um, CNN, Bloomberg, and many others. And then lastly, we wanted to change the way that journalism is taught. As we've said, this is a leadership and management issue. The fact that people didn't feel safe coming forward, they empowered the wrong people to lead who ended up being abusers and they stayed there for decades. Um, that's a leadership issue. It's not, it's not a woman's issue. And so the problem is that leadership and management isn't taught beginning in journalism schools. And so we're creating an open source national curriculum with the University of Texas at Austin. It's piloted this fall and we hope to release it in the fall of 2021 and make it open source and available to journalism schools and newsrooms nationwide. Um, in between these three really powerful initiatives, we continue to convene news leaders to share best practices about elevating women in the workplace and making sure that they're building cultures of inclusivity and trust. Um, and then we also um, participate in a number of newsroom conversations about culture. Okay, and what does that training look like? Let's say that a newsroom is watching today or, or a, a journalism school at a university is watching and they wanna sign up. What is it that they'd be signing up for? Like a multi-week in-person course when, when COVID is over and you can do in-person again, is it, what does that training look like? So the, it's a four hour training. The first two hours are with staff. Um, all of the staff, so it's, it's designed for a newsroom of about 65 people. And you have two pointer training, a man and a woman. Um, and they, they come in and they first meet with your staff and kind of set the baseline about culture and culture of safety and what sexual harassment looks like. And they run some scenarios. And then at the end of the training, uh, of the first part of the training, they facilitate a discussion about some of the, the top kind of problems facing the newsroom and or, or cultural issues that face the newsroom. And um, then the staff hopefully is equipped with a basic understanding of harassment. Um, and then leaders and managers that come together for the second part and we do some more deep dive training with them to make sure that they understand their responsibilities about harassment specifically, but then we help them digest some of the feedback that we get from staff about the cultural problems that they're facing and how to think about it and introduce some concepts in leadership and management that are kind of necessary for them to continue to carry on cultures of safety. Um, some interesting feedback that we've got after we piloted it is that uh, journalists, we did a survey before and after, and journalists before the training had said, um, I thought I knew what harassment looked like. Like, yeah, I know what harassment looks like. And then they took the training and they said, actually, I didn't know what harassment looked like. So there does need to be some discussion on the gray areas and how it manifests specifically in an industry. And I think that's the key thing. The reason why training has failed and we spent a year analyzing why, why harassment training has not been effective um, is because it's focused on victim stories and um, the, just the software clicking through video stuff doesn't work and it needs to be tailored to the profession. So people have to understand kind of how it manifests in the workplace. And then they need to know what to do with that. Like, what, what do we do when we experience harassment? Like, and, and actually practice the reaction. So um, one of the scenarios that we've designed in the first module of the training um, with the whole staff is, 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 is you know, a scenario in which a reporter faces harassment out in the field. And people assume the roles of a leader, um, the, the manager, or the reporter. And what was also really interesting in, in this is that um, the reporters are always the one who say like, well, I don't want to tell anybody. I just want to get the story. I want to be successful in my career. I want to plow through this. The managers are usually like, well, I think I need to report it. But, you know, like, yeah, like that is a good story, but I don't know if I want to send you out there. And, and then the leader is always the one, you know, the leader in the newsroom. Um, I've been pretty impressed so far. They're always the one that said, no, you're not going to go out there and be harassed by that person who says you have to do something in order to get the story. Like, we're not going to put you in danger. Um, and so that's kind of like the being able to practice and recognize though so, how this how this manifests and it was designed um, and, and informed by people who've actually experienced this in the field. Uh, and then we worked with legal experts to make sure that the journalists had the tools to know like what constitutes as illegal behavior and what is my responsibility for my reporters and I send them out in the field um, is what I think makes it so effective. Um, but it has to be taken seriously. Like you can't just be, we can't mock kind of how harassment manifests and 
the the outdated videos that we've seen just is part of the reason why I think it's it's perpetuated for as long as it have. If you listen to some of the stories of, of the men who've been outed, um, they still won't admit that they've done anything wrong. They say that they're they were pursuing relationships in the workplace and no, they were they were illegally harassing people. Um, and as long as they're given that type of airtime and explanation, then there's going to be confusion. So there should be no confusion about what happened with um, some of the big stories that we've read about in the in the press from Matt Lauer to Charlie Rose and Mark Halperin. Like there should be no confusion that what they did was wrong. Right. Can you give an example of one of those gray areas where somebody thought they knew what sexual harassment looked like and then realized later on that uh, there are other characteristics that maybe they hadn't hadn't thought of before. What's one of those gray area examples? Sure. Well, most people, well, not most people, but there's a good number of people who will meet their spouse in the workplace, right? Like it's a very natural thing in life <laughs> to meet someone, to, to form a relationship with someone that you work with. Before Me Too, you might be able to do that or get away with it if you're in the same department. Um, but after Me Too, people may not want to develop a relationship with someone who they work with in close quarters, maybe in a different department. Um, so it's okay to ask somebody out once <laughs> and to say, um, you know, I would love to get to know you or get a drink. Um, and if they say no, like you have to respect that and not punish them or penalize them or be resentful or harm their reputation behind the scenes. So that's an example of, of kind of the gray areas. Well, well, should I be able to ask out a coworker? Or what, what is this new world now? And the answer is like, yeah, you can still get to know people that you work with, but you can't make them feel uncomfortable by, by kind of pursuing them and stalking them and courting them. Um, and if they say no, you need to leave them alone and, and not punish them professionally. Um, what, you know, Charlie Rose did, for example, was he would call up his assistants and in the middle of the night and tell them like how attractive he thought that they were. And he would walk around naked and, um, you know, just really horrible things that, that no one should ever have to put up with. And he said that that was that to him, that was him pursuing relationships. No, it wasn't. That's harassment. So to me, that's like good grace. Oh, can I ask someone out? Black and white is you cannot walk around naked in front of people who you have power over. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope that helps. I'm, I'm happy to, I think what, what helps people learn is that actual scenario discussion and role playing. That's what we know for a fact is, is what helps impart understanding. Right. So I know from a previous conversation that you never thought you would be um, working at an organization like this in the first place. You obviously got your start in journalism. Where do you see the press forward 10 years from now? I mean, what's, what's the ideal goal that you have some kind of a training program in every major journalism university in every newsroom? Um, is it even bigger than that? What's the most ambitious outcome? Um, I, I 10 years from now, I, I want to still have these deep relationships and partnerships with universities and the University of Texas at Austin, where we've changed the way that journalism is taught, where leadership and management becomes a competency of the profession, where journalists know their rights and they feel supported because they've taken our trainings with the Pointer Institute, where everybody comes together and talks about the leadership pipeline and it's not controversial and they're transparent about it and we have just, they have discussions in their newsroom and they give credit to the data that's been collected. Um, and we have more, more balance at the top. Um, and where men and women feel comfortable working together, where we see uh, people with a, a cross-sectional backgrounds, um, you know, working together in harmony in the newsroom to, to better inform the public. Um, and I think it's important that newsrooms are the change that we're not. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's going to be the individuals within the newsrooms who are going to make the decisions and we're there to support them and to help them. Um, but, you know, the press forward can't be the, the, the one who's, who's going to be the true change agent. It's going to have to be journalists themselves and we're there to support them. Um, I mean, I think I told you I never thought that I would be working on these issues. Um, I, I am happy to take this detour as a chapter in my career because it's so important. It's persisted for so long. When you look at the data, how can you not get involved? And the fact that it's continuously sidelined is just a women's issue. And this, this sector is um, continually underinvested in. Um, there's not enough attention that's put on the work that's been done by the people who've laid the groundwork before us. It's really unacceptable. Um, and we have to work to lift up the people who've been left behind and brought into the workplace more to make sure that the most qualified, 
rise on their merits. Um, so it's, you know, I have a son and a daughter and I want both of them to be able to feel safe at work and rise on their merits and be in performance driven environments where it's not about who you are or what you look like or where you come from and more about the job that you do and you don't have to, to face toxic politics or um, harassment at work in order to be successful. Does the Me Too movement today have someone in charge or is it a completely decentralized movement? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, when it started, there was a lot of voices who were saying Me Too because everybody's, you know, faced something in their careers. Um, and some were more outspoken than others. Some couldn't move past their personal experiences or just wanted to focus on their personal experiences and their own healing. And they got a lot of press attention because their harassers were famous. And, you know, that's, we totally support them if that's the best option that they think they want to take. Um, we support them in their personal capacity. Um, and then there were the, the, the organizations that kind of recognized the bigger picture about what these issues were about, which is that um, it's about inequality, it's about uh, toxic workplaces, and the fact that workers don't know their rights, and we have to put some structure around it in order to um, fix these problems. So some you know, there have been a lot of organizations that have been at this for a long time, like the National Women's Law Center. Um, they, t they teamed up with Time's Up to do the Legal Defense Fund um, with all the Hollywood actresses, and then that's across sectors, and they're playing a really critical role um, because they are helping women journalists and, all, and other sectors like McDonald's who faced harassment um, fight. Otherwise, they'd be left behind. There's just no way that you, it's a, and when you face harassment in a large company, it's a David and Goliath issue, and, and you do need the PR and legal support um, of, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and most people who face harassment are in, are in low wage industries and they're very vulnerable. Um, so they've kind of given a voice to, to women who are powerless. Um, and that they are, you know, they're kind of, they're one of the leaders in the movement as is Time's Up. Um, and they're all, we're all pivoting though between those who kind of lifted up the, the stories of, of their personal experiences. That's, that's kind of like was a start. But then you have to put some some professionalism behind um, the mechanisms that are needed to create corporate change in the workplace. Now, remember, I said that Me Too is both about domestic violence and um, abuse in the workplace. And Tarana Burke, who coined the Me Too name, uh, is also raising awareness for for black women and people of color who faced who have faced domestic violence, which has become exacerbated by COVID. Um, and the, the challenges that they face. So she's continuing to, to advocate for them and um, to provide resources to survivors who face domestic violence. And then there are organizations like the Purple Campaign, Time's Up, the Press Forward, who have decided to advocate for workplace change and uh, making sure that, that workers know their rights and are focused on kind of the, the longer term systemic change. Um, so, I hope that makes sense. There's always, and there's, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of people who laid the groundwork before us who just weren't able to make the change that was necessary in part because the press didn't give them attention. Um, the press plays a critical role in all of this, which is why it's so ironic that, or not ironic, we, we shouldn't be surprised that the, if, if we believe that um, this is a power issue, then there's power in newsrooms. Of course, it's going to be abused and we have to talk about how to prevent that. And it's really critical the press gets that right because it's their job to hold the powerful to account. So is that the difference between Me Too and Time's Up is that Time's Up it has to do with the workplace and Me Too is just harassment in general? Um, well, no, Me Too, Me Too, which was coined by Toronto Burke, focuses on um, a, a domestic violence. So especially black women and people of color who've experienced abuse at home. Um, Time's Up, me too became kind of like a catch-all phrase for harassment, mm -hmm. right? But um, Toronto, and, and it's still used, it can be used in either, either case in the workplace or at home, but I'm just, I'm just explaining the Me Too as an organization, um, it focuses on domestic abuse and then Time's Up has focused on abuse in the workplace and creating um, equal environments for, for people of all backgrounds. Okay, great. That clears that up. Thank you. Um, it's, it's been uh, a lot. And I think men haven't been paying very close attention to it in general. 
um, as much as they should be. And so I appreciate you coming on to clarify some of these things. Um, before I, we that is, so I would love to know why, um, if we could have an honest conversation, why, yeah. why are men afraid to, to talk about this? I mean, it's so pervasive and it's, it's affected so many women. And if they don't engage the conversation and listen more, I mean, I just worry that all these women's, women's organizations that are trying to affect change aren't gonna reach the people who need to change if they're not being listened to. I think it's like what you said at, uh, earlier on where it's just kind of tribal and people shut down. Uh, certain men thought that this was an attack uh, from women to men. And so maybe they stopped listening. Um, I'm not sure, but it's also, it's also been kind of confusing because it's so decentralized and it's, uh, it's taken off on social media that it's hard for me to know when, what something is me too versus time's up um, and the use of the hashtags. Can you speak to the use of the hashtag in general? Is this like the, the greatest use of the hashtag that we've seen to date? The hashtag me too? What do you mean the greatest use of it? I mean, the most organizing um, factor was the hashtag for this movement, right? Yeah, yeah. So the way that that transpired is that, so Toronto Burke um, was doing, you know, she was doing the work. Like we, we say that you have to do the work. Like she did the work. Like she was a leader in, the, she was a leader in domestic violence and, and advocating for very vulnerable women for a very long time. And um, uh, she, she used the phrase, um, me too, like if you've experienced abuse mm -hmm. and everybody started saying me too. Um, and then there was a really famous actress who decided to put it on Twitter. And she's like, if you've faced abuse, say me too. And then it went viral. And that's when at the same time that it kind of went viral, the Harvey Weinstein report had happening, started the Harvey Weinstein reporting started happening. And then it just was, you know, a rift in our society and culture. It turned out that some of the most powerful people across industries um, ended up abusing women and vulnerable people. Um, and women can do it to men because it's a power issue. And then it, you know, really said something about the workplace that this was so pervasive. It said, you know, and so that's how Me Too ended up kind of exploding was that it had been invisible, but everybody had suffered from it at, at some phase in time and, and especially women. Um, but Me Too began and again, like on kind of the domestic abuse side, and then it became also used for um, harassment experienced in the workplace. So, um, you know, Tarana, I think, stayed pretty close to her um, focus and she has continued to advocate for, for those who don't have a voice and her work is so important and so critical for, for women of color um, and making sure that, that we address violence at home and, and domestic violence. But the phrase also then became used for um, what we experience in the workplace and uh, or things that are associated with work. Um, so it did become kind of a catch-all phrase, but when you get into the mechanics of the organizations, that's how um, you can kind of recognize the difference, which is that Me Too, created by Toronto Burke, she has her own organization that focuses on domestic violence, Time's Up, Press Forward, um, Lift Our Voices, all these other groups that, uh, and organizations that were founded focused on abuse in the workplace. Right. Okay, so I have uh, two final questions for you. They're the two somewhat silly questions that I ask every guest at the end of each episode. Um, but before I ask those questions, can you give listeners um, where they should follow you or the work you're doing at The Press Forward? Sure. So we are at The Press Forward on Twitter. Um, you can go to thepressforward.org. I, I am at, um, at CM Supple on Twitter. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. So please give us feedback or if you want to engage or if you want to learn more about how we, you could bring us to your newsrooms, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, great. Um, for the last two questions, uh, hopefully you know what Bitcoin is, but the first question is Bitcoin believer or not so much? No comment. <laughs> that's fair. The, the Bitcoin community can be a bit aggressive, so that's probably the safest. Um, my last question is even more silly, um, unless you believe in it, but are we living in a simulation, yes or no? Living in a simulation. Yes, because COVID does not feel real. I still cannot believe that this is our reality. I'm hoping that this is just some strange um, experiment that we will wake up tomorrow and go back to normal. And we will, 
but right now it does feel like a simulation. Great. You're the first yes on the podcast so far for yes, we live in a simulation. All right. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us today on the Creditor Podcast. Um, I hope all of our listeners go and follow your work. Thank you again for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And it's, it's, it's good to connect with you and see you again, Chase.